Hebrew chapter 13, verse 17. Obey those who rule over you and be submissive, for they watch out for your souls as those who must give an account, and that's to God. Let them do so with joy and not with grief, for that would be unprofitable for you. Let me read that in the new century. Obey your leaders and act under their authority. They are watching over you because they are responsible for your souls. Obey them so that they will do this work with joy, not sadness. It will not help you to make their work hard. And I want to read this as a verse on the sides, Philippians 2, verse 14. It'll be on the screen, New Living. Do everything without complaining and arguing so that no one can criticize you. This song speaks to this. Live clean, innocent lives as children of God, shining like bright lights in a world full of crooked and perverse people. Hold firmly to the word of life. Then on that day of Christ's return, I will be proud that I did not run the race in vain and that my work was not useless. Paul is encouraging those at Philippians who had believed on the gospel through the preaching of the gospel, through his preaching, that they would live right, hold on to the word of God, let their light so shine before men, so that when Jesus returns and find them serving him, he would be proud and realize that he had not run this race in vain. From the subject, make me proud. Make, make me proud. Father, thank you. Strengthen us. Give us ears to hear what the Spirit says. Thank you for this month of appreciation. Thank you, God, as I have received from so many words of encouragement, and exhortations, even at this moment. My son, Bishop Alfred Blue, thank you for him. Such a timely message at this very moment. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Put your hands together for the word of the Lord. I just received the text um, that is a very powerful exhortation. Just um, a man that I love dearly, Bishop Alfred D. Blue. Um, who just texted me for my love and support, an example of leadership in his life over the years. And at this stage in his life, having transitioned his ministry to his son to be senior pastor, and he still yet is the bishop and overseer, he and his wife. Um, he endeavors to be to others, he says, but you have been to me, Dad. I love you always. Let me define what I mean by the use of the word proud. So many people, when they hear that word, it carries a negative connotation. How many of y'all, when you hear proud, you go like, pride go before destruction, and I said proud, not pride. <laughs> but let me define proud when I say proud. Proud is a feeling of satisfaction as a result of one's own achievements. And that's one definition, and you could take exception in that. But secondly, by proud, I mean a feeling of satisfaction in response to the achievements of someone that you are closely associated with or someone you're in a relationship with. Are y'all following that? So you can be proud of someone when you see them accomplish something that they set out to accomplish. You can say to them, you did it. I'm so proud of you. 
That's a good pride, right? The pic on the screen here is my grandson when he was a little baby. Um, that's little Steven with his I Love Granddad onesie on. He has on a onesie, I Love Granddad. And I'm so proud of him because he was born three months premature. And I remember being in Georgia and getting the news that my daughter-in-law had had to have an emergency situation and I jumped in the car in the middle of a conference and just left in the middle of the night. And I think I was the first one there coming from Georgia and, uh, and got there and there he was uh, strapped with all of these gadgets on him in an incubator. And um, I was proud that he eventually moved from the incubator to a onesie. Yeah. And, um, and, and yeah. The, the other pic that you see there is, uh, is him this past Friday where he qualified for state competition in the spelling bee for first graders. He did it right here on this stage. School from around the city academies, Christian academies came together and um, it was also his birthday. And he turned seven years old. And I can truly say he made me proud. <clears throat> so my use of the word proud is in that context. When Paul said in Philippians 2, 14, these words, do everything without complaining and arguing so that no one can criticize you. Live clean and innocent lives as children of God, shining like bright lights in a world full of crooked and perverse people. Hold firmly to the word of life. Then on the day of Christ's return, I'll be proud that I did not run the race in vain and that my work was not useless. Amen. He's saying, y'all achieve what it is that you purpose to achieve. Do that which you are called to do. Be that which you are destined to be. Keep pursuing. Keep growing. Keep pressing. Keep serving. Be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding. And uh, be lights in a dark world. Be different than the rest of the world. This dance depicted that. Put off some things. Repent of some things. And glorify God in your members. If you demonstrate your relationship with Christ by, the, by willingly serving the Lord. If you follow after Christ and pursue holiness and live a pure life as pure as possible. If you let your light so shine before men that others might see your good works and glorify the Father. And if you, as it says in this text, hold on to the word of life, then when Jesus returns, you'll make me proud. Right? For then I, he will receive you as his own. And then I'll receive my crown because I did my job well. Amen. You've heard me say from this pulpit over and over again, it's not about me. It's not about who's up here on stage. It's not about the singers. It's you being free and you being blessed and you being used by God and you having a work to do and you're able to endure stuff. How many times do I have to say that? And this is what you're going to hear Paul say because there's some people you can say it all day and they'll never get it. You model for them, and Paul modeled for them a life in Christ, and even how to be human and, and, and tap into the grace of God. And everything that we do is a demonstration to others that if God can use me, you ought to say that about yourself. If God can use me, he can use anybody. And we don't take that for granted, right? We realize that it is by his grace. That we do. But religion has this connotation. Religion puts rules and regulations. You heard the dance, the song, right? It's religion that brought me to Christ. It's religion that he delivered me from. Man's efforts to be right with God. Man's misunderstanding of who God is and what God requires and what God has done. There's some people who are in the church, I mean, my God, and they really don't know why. Every local church needs a strong ecclesiology, needs to understand the nature, the purpose, and the structure of the church. If you don't, you will be guilty of church abuse. 
abuse two words abnormal use if you don't know what the church is for you will abnormally use it you will abuse it it's not for your promotion it's not for you to become famous it's not for you to get over on god it's not for you none of that kind of stuff it's our obedience to the call of God on our life that networks us and brings us together with other people, like-minded people who've also repented of their sins and put their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And so we become one body in Christ, bone of each other's bone, flesh of each other's flesh, one new man. We are of each other and we are in him. And there's only one church. The Apostle Paul is a great mentor to us pastors, especially during Pastors Appreciation Week, and I want to speak today on the behalf of many pastors, pastors who seek to do the work of God sincerely. Not every pastor is sincere. You're right. Not every pastor is of God. You're definitely right. If you ever thought that, you are definitely right. Our pre-qualifications to walk in the office or to be in the office of pastor is found in letters that Paul has written. First Timothy 3, and the bishop or the pastor, the elder, the overseer must be. Titus chapter 1, and an elder must be. There are qualifications, prerequisite to becoming or even using the title. Because what good is a title without a towel? Uh, the qualification to get to a place of leadership in the church is first servitude and humilitude. Is humility the word? Yeah, humility. <laughs> so humility and servitude. Jesus is that example, and Paul is referencing Jesus when he talks in Philippians chapter 2 about how he humbled himself and found in the fashion as a man, became obedient, was a servant, and, and, and endured, and all the way to the end, I mean, until he died, he, he remained faithful to the call of his father on his life. He gave himself, was obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Pastoring is not something you just do because you want to do it, right? Who would want to be a pastor? The responsibility is grandiose. It is absolutely uh, much. And um, for lack of a better word, much. Uh, Paul talks about what he has to do in his own struggle, his call of God, his planting of churches, his, his journeys, um, even being incarcerated many, many times for preaching the gospel. And while he's on lockdown, he still has this burden, wanting to see the church grow and prosper and blossom, hearing about issues in the church and penning letters from prisons so that they would know how to behave themselves in the household of faith. But Paul even writes to the members of the church how they should relate to their pastors, to their elders, their bishops, their overseers. First Thessalonians 5.12 says this, now, brothers and sisters, we ask you to appreciate those who work hard among you, who lead you in the Lord and teach you. Respect them with a very special love because of the work they do and live in peace with each other. That's a very simple uh, e exhortation. And some of you who may not be good Christians, who may hear me read those verses and wonder, am I talking about me? Yes. Yes, yes, I am. I, I really am. Uh, you, you should, you know, make sure that you, you know, respect and appreciate uh, our hard work and, and, and show some special love because of the work and live in peace with each other. Much of what we know about church discipline, even, and the proper use of even spiritual gifts. <laughs> <laughs> and even how we should dwell together as the body of Christ, we get it from the tutelage of the Apostle Paul. Colossians 3, verse 12 through 15. Since God chose you to be the holy people he loves, you must clothe yourself with tenderhearted mercy, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Make allowance for each other's faults, and forgive anyone who offends you. Remember, the Lord forgave you, so you must forgive others. Above all, clothe yourself with love, 
which binds us all together in perfect harmony. And let the peace that comes from Christ rule in your hearts. For as members of one body, you are called to live in peace and always be thankful. Amen. Amen. In everything, give thanks. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Paul speaks about harmony, right? None of this happens without first humility, without having a right relationship with Christ. And once the spirit of Christ lives in you, these things, though they may not be manifest right now, they are possible and they may be in your future. Paul also mentors pastors on how they should care for the flock. He charges pastors to protect the people of God against wolves from the outside and the snakes on the inside. In Acts 20, he encourages the church of Ephesus. He says, therefore, take heed, verse 28, to yourselves and to the flock of God, among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers, to shepherd the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. For I know this, that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. Also, from among you, men will rise up, speaking perverse things to draw away the disciples after themselves. From the outside and from the inside. But he says uh, to, to those leaders, take heed first to yourself and then to the flock of God. In other words, take care of yourself. Uh, somebody asked me this morning, how you doing? Somebody asked me last night, how you doing? Somebody asked me two days ago, how you doing? Somebody asked me the day before that, how you doing? And I think people who know what I do, who love me, are concerned about how I'm doing, right? The, 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 yeah, take heed to yourself and then to the flock of God. Yeah, I fly a lot. I have over a million miles, almost two million miles on airlines and whatnot. And they would tell you that if the cabin pressure changes and the mask drops down from the ceiling, take that mask, put it over your face first. And then if you're traveling with a child or somebody acting like a child, then help them put the mask on their face. Because you cannot help anybody else when you suck in air yourself. You see the principle there? You, you have to take care of yourself uh, physically, mentally, emotionally, uh, and particularly spiritually, right? So Paul's letters are loaded. Is, is this fun? Yeah. Loaded with instruction on how to handle disputes and disunity and discord that will occur amongst, excuse my vernacular, church folk. Yeah, church folk. Ain't nothing like church folk. I was in the hospital yesterday and visiting, and the um, day before yesterday, and yesterday, but the day before yesterday, and uh, one of the nurses said that um, she had just come back from a 30 day trip. And I said, Oh, that's nice. She said, Well, I drove from Jacksonville to Seattle, Washington, and uh, stopped along the way with just a pop up camper. And she said, well, that's great. Who helped you drive? She said, oh, it was just me, my two cats, and my dog. I said, well, you can find nobody to go with you. She said, oh, don't deal with people. <laughs> she said, I don't deal with people. Last time I tried to do that, I tried to stop at certain scenic lookouts. And the dude is like, hey, we got time to stop here. We're too close to the edge. And how long are we going to stay here? She said, I want to sit there and take in the ambiance. And they just complain and they said this and that. So she said, I don't deal with people. And I said, you know what? When I was young, I used to always say, the church and the move of God and everything would just be fine if it wasn't for people. <laughs> and she said, that's what I'm talking about right there. And she said, people just can mess stuff up because people are people and they're different. Imagine trying to mesh all of these personalities together to work together. See, people have regulated the church of Jesus Christ to a place of revival, a place of renewal, where you just come to get blessed, where you just come to get hand laid on you, where you got to hear somebody speak in tongues and prophesy and jump up and quicken and everything. But the body of Christ has been placed in a local setting like this and given pastors, teachers, so that you can be equipped to go and do the work of the ministry so that the body of Christ can be built up. 
That's why you got these people floating, people woo, that run around from church to church and from, you know, revival to revival and conference to conference and are nothing but broke. Because it costs your plane ticket, your car, your gas, your registration, and then getting in the money lines and giving your last and emptying your accounts to people you'll never see again, don't know they were crooks to begin with, and you couldn't even discern because you're so busy looking for a feeling that you don't know who Jesus is. In his letters, we learn how to relate to spiritual leaders, how to obey uh, them. Um, they're in charge of our, our souls and how to serve them and serve together with them, how to esteem them highly, how to follow them, etc. But also, the scriptures reveal how to know their hearts, know them which labor among you and over you in the Lord. Paul calls the church a household. In Galatians 6, he calls it the household of faith. So I want you to listen to a very interesting passage, passage and let's see if we can grasp this particular concept, 1 Corinthians 3, 15. For even if you had 10,000 others to teach you about Christ, you have only one spiritual father. For I became your father in Christ Jesus when I preached the good news to you. King James said you may have 10,000 instructors, but you have not many fathers. Paul speaks to those who are in the congregation at the church of Corinth. And he's responsible for them because he shared the gospel with them. You might see it in Acts 18 and other passages where he actually preached and they believed their lives were changed because of his preaching of the gospel. Uh, his, his, their lives um, are now changed because what he's teaching them and what he pre preached to them has actually now gotten in a position where it governs their behavior that they heard him say something that shifted something in them. He said, I've begotten you. They shifted something in them. Uh, they may have been God-fearing, but didn't know really who God was. They may have, let's just put it in today's vernacular, been a member of a church, but didn't know Jesus. So he comes along and he preaches unto them that all the activity and stuff must be focused on the cross, on the, the fact that Christ came, lived, died, was buried, and rose again the third day. So there are people in this room who had pastors that some of y'all mistook as spiritual fathers. What happened was you got saved by Jesus, you joined a church, and you never got nothing. From, how can y'all remember a time, and I don't want to be despairing against sincere pastors who just didn't know no better, but how many of y'all grew up in churches where you didn't learn absolutely nothing, you were grown, and you had a Bible under your arm, and carried on, but you were mean as hell, cussing like a sailor, drinking like a fish, come on, drink, dropping like it's hot, drop it, drop it like it's hot. You were doing all of that in the name of the Lord. And then one day you heard somebody say something to you. You heard a message. You heard the gospel. You were challenged. All of a sudden, something shifted in you. Come on, and now what you're hearing begins to govern your life, begins to navigate you, begin to move you into areas and the places you didn't even know existed. Now you've entered another dimension of relationship, and now you can't wait to get to the house of God. You can't wait to leave the house of God. You can't wait to get up in the morning. Him. You can't wait to engage somebody or to touch somebody. You got to share with somebody the same love, the same power that is at work in your life. Now you're sharing it with whoever gets in your way. And now you have a spiritual guide, a spiritual father. Now you have a pastor teacher who is equipping you for the work of the ministry. And Paul says, if that's you, I am your spiritual father. Paul speaks to those in the congregation and he says in verse 15, for I became your father in Christ Jesus when I preached the good news to you. I became your father. You need to have that test and Maury needs to be here. You are the father. A father is one who nurtures. His words produce life, hope, and faith in their children. The father supplies the seed for the gestation to begin. 
Every true pastor who is a true spiritual father seeks to produce life and hope and faith in the people that they get to lead by sowing the seed of God's word into their hearts. And when the pastor sees the seed take root and then those that they feed mature in faith and they start growing and being what God's called them to be, it makes them proud. Many of you know what it's like to be proud of your own children. Maybe I bring this home because some of y'all are bored think I'm talking about me. But as you watch your kids go from tiny tots to adults, many of you know what it's like to be made proud as you see them graduate from sixth grade and even kindergarten. Or if you are from Jacksonville, in the words of Stephen A. Smith, kindergarten. <laughs> yeah, I got a grown attorney, a uh, jurisprudence, a JD. I said, oh, wh what's that? What are they doing? The kid? He said, oh, they're in kindergarten. Kindergarten. It's kindergarten. Okay? All right, so I thought I'd help you with that. <sighs> you watch them become adults, and they make you proud. How many of you are proud of your children? I'm proud of my two kids, Angel, Stephen. I'm proud of you. You just need to know you have made Daddy proud. But also, many of you know what it's like to be saddened over the actions of your children when you raised them right, but dumb boogers live wrong. When you have to look at them and say, boy, I did not raise you like that. Girl, I did not, you did not get that from me. Where you get that from? Who are these people you bringing off up in my house? Where you think you going this time of night? Girl, if you don't put some clothes on, I'm gonna snatch that weave out of you. If you don't do this, how many y'all know what I'm talking about? And then sometimes it does not make you proud. They never seem to get out of their adolescence and they stay juvenile for the rest of their life. Just juvenile, never mature, never grow up. Who is that? I don't want to grow up. I don't want Peter Pan. Toys are us. I don't want to go to school. That's Peter Pan. Somebody holler, Toys are us. <laughs> Elder Coma. <laughs> oh, that was Andre. Yeah, uh, okay, I got it now. <laughs> I have a very good reason for preaching this message today like I am. Number one is to end the pastor's appreciation month. And honestly, I feel appreciated, right? I feel appreciated. But number two, the real reason. For some reason, I have been running into multiple people when I'm out and about on the town who recognize me, even if I don't recognize them, and they can't wait to give me a hug or say hi to me. And then I see some people, in addition, who are members of other churches, and they recognize me as the pastor of this church, and they can't wait to tell me who their pastor is. They, they, people just do that. They run to me. Hi, my name's Cheryl so-and-so, and my pastor is Reverend Dr. William III. My pastor is Bishop Butler, and they just love to do that. Like, they're proud of their pastor, you know, like, they just can't wait to tell me, you ain't my pastor. <laughs> I got a pastor. Like, some of y'all went, I got a man. <laughs> oh, I see their faces light up. And they let me know my pastor is so-and-so. But here's something I must share with y'all. I got to do this. I got to do this. There have been times where I know the pastor very well. So I mentioned to the pastor that I saw one of the members of the church that they need, that they lead, and they approached me and they said, Pastor, they love you to life. I mean, Pastor, they were lit. 
And then the pastor knows who I'm talking about. But they don't have the same response or the same look on their faces. They don't light up like their members did. Y'all not helping me here. They don't seem to be as excited about who that is and what they mean to them as what they mean to them. All right, of course, I was thinking, what's up with that? So I think about Hebrews verse 13, chapter 13, verse 17 that I read. Listen to what it says. Be responsive to your pastoral leaders. Listen to their counsel. They are alert to the condition of your lives and work under the strict supervision of God. Contribute to the joy of their leadership, not as drudgery. Why would you want to make things harder for them? And so I'm a little inquisitive, so I always go a little farther. I'd be like, well, Pastor, why you look like that? Why weren't you as excited as they were? See, the person maybe had made pastoring harder for them. Maybe counsel was given, as the text says, and the person didn't adhere to it. And ain't nothing worse than trying to counsel somebody and they don't listen to you. If you ain't going to listen to me, let me go fishing. <laughs> you, you, and, and listen, I'm going to say it one more time for all y'all who think you need counsel. You don't need counsel. You just need to get right. You already know. You already know what the problem is. Well, baby, I'm going to come home on time. But, baby, I'm going to stop doing this. Now. I'm going to stop hanging out with the fellas. I'm going to stop doing that. I'm going to stop going and spending all this money on my hair, my nails, getting the. I'm going to stop. You already know what the issue is. That was not a part of the message, but that's, for, that's general counseling, okay? You know what's wrong with you. Just quit it. Do what the song says. Repent. Stop it. Stop it. Come on, y'all not help me. Look at somebody and tell them, stop it. Stop it. <laughs> or maybe, listen, listen, don't let me lose you. Don't let me lose you. Maybe they're one of those people who hear the word but don't do it. We have special members, you know. They, they don't miss nothing. But they don't hear nothing. Because they don't do nothing. Uh, <laughs> it, it, it's called the committed folk. <laughs> the church would not be the church without committed folk. But some of the committed folk need committing. They ain't just committed to anything. They don't care what happened. They don't care what's going down. That's my church. That's my pastor. I don't care what y'all say. Ain't really doing nothing. Don't contribute nothing. They're always here trying to get the rent paid, the bills paid, the food. And this, all that food and stuff back there, they want special food. They want to go to Publix. They don't want the food pantry. I mean, they just them special people. I, I did a lot of TBN back in the day when TBN was really there. Paul and Jan Krause loved me, you know, this and that. I would go on the set. And how many of y'all remember riding the bus with me down to Miami? Anybody jump on that bus? How many times you saw me get on that bus and I look at the bus at everybody that's going and I start counting. I start looking. They want to know how many people come and I start looking and I start seeing faces and I get off the bus. I have a tear running down this side of my face. I be like, where they going? Why are they on this bus? <laughs> but they committed now. They ain't that's my pastor. They get to the studio. They ah, 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 ah. I walk out the back. They ah, ah, and I go like, oh my God. <laughs> she the loudest one in here too. Can I say this? Can't stand her. That's what the pastors, that's what they were, that's basically what they were saying when the people say to me, I love my pastor, they'd be all lit up and then the pastor look at me, this pastor talk, I'm just sharing with you, I'm sorry, I'm speaking on behalf of every pastor in America, I said that when I got started, right, I'm speaking on behalf of every pastor, I know, I know those pastors. 
And they'll say stuff like, man, that dude crazy as a bitch above. Man, I've been trying for years to get rid of them. They're like a rubber band, man. They just keep bouncing back. Or maybe it's one of those who don't realize, maybe just don't realize that their behavior is whack. You got sincere people. You have people at different levels, right? Maybe they don't realize they're making it hard for the other members even to deal with them. Maybe they just don't see it. It's blind spots. How many of y'all have discovered your blind spot one day after a while people tell you the same thing and you don't see it? Yeah, you've been running into everything, hitting everything. You don't even see it. It's a blind spot. You got issues. I've had to discover mine over the years. I've seen them, man. I, I used to say stupid. You think I'm crazy? Nah, I used to say some stupid stuff from the pulpit, you know. I'm not blasting people. I just use phrases and words and stuff that I wish I could have taken back when I said them. The moment they went out of my mouth, I went like, no. <laughs> now I got to dress it up. I got to fix it up. I got to make it think I was quoting somebody else. And yeah, you know I wouldn't say that. <laughs> so there's a certain thing that some of us do. And there's certain things that we don't know we're doing. And it could be impacting our relationship with other people. So all of us should know something. And that is, there have been many times where these pastors would even say to me, when I mentioned who they were. You want them? <laughs> I'm sure you'll do a better job than, than me with them, and they love you. You can have them. I threaten Kobe Nesbitt all the time when we have issues, and we had an issue with a couple of our members, real bad issues, and I sent them to his church. It was either get another restraining order, which we had a restraining order. We've had restraining orders on several, several people for your protection, right? So instead of get another restraining order, I, 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 I worked with them. You either go to, we call the police, or you go to Truth and Love. And Pastor Kobe will call me in the middle of the night, Bishop. <laughs> so leading folk, a lot of times, it's true, I'm, <laughs> it's like herding cats. You ever try to herd cats? You go to the park with your dogs and you go, let's go. They go, <laughs> you go to the cat dog park with your cats and say, let's go. They go. One in a tree, one over here in the woods, one over there, you know, you just. So here's what we need to learn, and I'm going to try to close this. Put it on the screen. Fellowship is just as important as fellowship. The church has not done a good job of teaching people how to follow. Can I use somebody? Uh, Sam, you come help me. You're always good at this. Come up here. You help me. Just, just, I want you to follow me, all right? So you just follow me, all right? We went, uh, Steve might remember this. We were in Africa. And still, no, sit behind me, son. Get thee behind me. <laughs> Follow me. So, it, 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 stay behind me. So stay behind me, son. Stay behind me. Stay behind me. Just stay right where you are. I'm turning around talking to them. <laughs> it's like herding cats. <laughs> Follow me. Now, is he following me or is he walking behind me?
Turn around, and I want you to walk slowly. That I'm going to follow you. Turn around. Hold on. But tell you that. Man, why don't you turn around and face that way? Why are you looking back? What is, what is wrong with him? Now I'm going to follow him. You can start. Now notice what I was doing. I'm following him. Notice where I'm looking. I'm looking at his footsteps, not his head. I'm not trying to be the head. I'm trying to follow. Go on, sit down somewhere if I hit you. I'm trying to follow in his footsteps. First Peter says it like this. It's on the screen. It says, for God called you to do good, even if it means suffering, just as Christ suffered for you, he is your example, and you must follow in his steps. We have followed heads and looked up, but we've not followed the steps. We have not walked like he walked. We've not done the thing. To walk like somebody walk is to have their character, is to know what they're about, is to do what they do. Those things that you have both heard and seen in me, Paul said, do. Then the God of peace will be with you. So we follow me, my. Yeah. So we, we want to walk like Jesus walks. We want to follow in his footsteps. Not like Sam did, but <laughs> his footsteps. I believe that I speak on the behalf of every pastor again in the world when I say to you that if you want to make a pastor happy or if you want to make a pastor proud, then you should learn how to follow. Yeah. First Corinthians 11 and 1 Be ye followers of me even as I am also of Christ. Amen. I'm a follower of Christ. You say, imitate me as I imitate Christ. Follow me, Paul says, as I follow Christ. When he was sitting Sylvanus and some of the other, uh, his other protégés and other disciples and people that he had made, people he had led to the Lord, he would say, receive them. They walk like I walk. When you get them, you get me. Because I have mentored them, and here they are. I have instructed them, and they walk like I walk. Okay, here's the other side of the coin. I think we've also not done a good job of teaching members how to leave. I've taught over the years that there are all kinds of reasons why someone may not continue to follow a particular pastor or even in a particular ministry. I give you all three reasons. What are those reasons? Some people are with you for a reason. Some people are with you for a season. And some people are with you for treason. High treason. They're going to eventually betray you. You have no idea the number of people that I have given up my time, resources, they have robbed me of my true family time with my spouse, my kids. They like the songs that they keep running in and out of my life. They just keep coming in and going, taking, never giving, taking, never giving, always taking and never giving. And there are a couple of things going on. Number one, they're here for a reason or season or treason. But then number two, they probably should never have been here to begin with. We call them, what, satanic interruptions? During the course of a day when somebody comes by with the purpose of ripping you off, with the purpose of taking and not giving, with the purpose of, and, and it looks like a real need, but they done been to four other places before they got to you. And they're trying to make it seem like you're the answer to their question for the day because they've learned from the last three places what not to say. But then there's just certain people, even in the body of Christ, that become members that can trouble you, that can labor you, that can make it hard for us pastors because maybe you should never have been here. How many pastors do you know say that, huh? It's the Bible, 1 Corinthians, 1 John 2, 19. Here's what it says. They went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would have had continued with us. But they went out that they might be made known or manifest that none of them were of us. 
church didn't even say amen. Lord, did you hear that? I just said they went out from among us to prove that they were never really of us, for they have truly been of us. They would have no doubt to continue with us even until this day. They all gone and they left because they should have never been here. And these people sitting here going, they didn't even say I'm glad they're gone. They didn't even say praise the Lord they're gone. They didn't even say amen to the reading of God's word. So put it back up on the screen. Put it back up on the screen. Let's read it together. They went out from us. But they were not of us, for if they had been of us, they would have continued with us. But they went out that they might be made manifest that none of them were of us. Yeah. That should be good news for some of y'all. Where that dude going? The, the dude, the dude, the real weird dude. He gone. Pray the Lord. See, we can't even say stuff like that. The Bible even says that we ought to mock those who are unruly among us, that we should separate ourselves from them. The word mock them, mark them, is in our vernacular, take a picture of them, put them up in the lobby so people will know who to stay away from. <laughs> oh, 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 there's another one. Number three, maybe, just maybe, maybe, they just may not have been saved. Jesus is going to prove this. All right now. How many know the parable of the sower? Watch me. How many know the parable of the sower? Well, the sower goes out to sow. And that sower, the parable is the sower is the preacher. And the soil are the hearts of men, right? He goes out to sow. So then Jesus says, y'all know the parable, so let me explain it to you. Matthew 13, 18. Jesus explains this. Now listen to the explanation of the parable about the farmer planting seeds. Now follow me closely. Watch it. It's on the screen. This is about to get good. Somebody might get saved or just get up and leave because you should have never been here. <laughs> or you're here for reason, treason, or for season. You know, I don't know. <laughs> I just don't know. But, but this, here, tell you what I'm going to be. I'm going to be honest with you, right? I'm going to tell you the truth in love, right? I'm going to help you. I don't want nobody to die and go to heaven because I got to answer to God for everybody that come through that door. And when I had an opportunity to present the gospel to them, did I do it effectively? And did I bring them to a decision about who Jesus is? It ain't about how cute I am or how good I look, how sweet I sound. It's not how I sound. It's how sound I am. And I want to be sound. I want to be able to present to you a message that unlike your grandmama in them church, your auntie in them church, your cut in them church and any other religious order that you have been in I want you to know Jesus Christ for yourself I want you to be sure of your relationship with God I want you to examine yourself to see if you're really in the faith because I don't care who you are if you ain't saved and you died today in hell you're gonna lift up your eyes you are not going to heaven without Jesus the only ticket to heaven is the name of Jesus the only name given among men whereby we must be saved if you do not have a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ the resurrected Savior you can be dressed up today smelling good today looking good today have your edges laid today and it and still go to hell Last time you heard that in a religious service, what doesn't happen to preachers? We don't talk about heaven, hell, rapture, eternity, judgment, nothing. I told y'all last week, was it Wednesday night? I talked about the way the world and the church don't get so mixed up. Dude said he couldn't believe he went to a church service like this. And a lady pulled out a cigarette and lit it. And watch this. Made him almost drop his beer. <laughs> I know you help him out. I know you. I, know you. I see you. I see she tried to see him. He be quiet. He gonna be all right. He all right. He 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 just look crazy. He all right though. He all right. Listen to the explanation of the parable about the farmer sowing seeds. Verse nineteen: The seed that fell on the footpath by the wayside represent those who hear the message about the kingdom and don't understand it. 
then the evil one comes and snatches away the seed that was planted in their hearts. Now, verse 20, the seed on the rocky soil represent those who hear the message and immediately receive it with joy. But since they don't have deep roots, they don't last long. They fall away as soon as they have problems or are persecuted for believing God's word. And then, verse 22, the seed that fell among the thorns represents those who hear God's word, but all too quickly, the message is crowded out by the worries of this life and the lure of wealth, and so no fruit is produced. But then the seed that fell on good soil represents those who truly hear and understand God's word and produce a harvest of 30, 60, and even 100 times as much as had been planted. Why do I take my time? I want you to understand the word. I don't want you to hear it and then not understand it. And then the adversary come immediately and steal it out of your heart. And then you gone. I want you to hear it and understand it so that when the sun rises and, and, and trouble comes, you'll be rooted and you'll be able to stand. I want you to understand it so that when the cares of this world, the deceitfulness of riches, the desire to be somebody, to live your best life now comes in and you can't feel comfortable doing that and the world, the world and the church. You're too worldly for the church and too churchy for the world and you just don't fit in nowhere. That we don't see you no more. Three out of the four people that heard the word didn't endure until the end. The Bible says, he that endureth until the end, the same shall be saved. The fact that you still have persevering faith when Jesus comes back again guarantees your eternal existence with God, guarantees your salvation. We got to let the wheat and the tear grow together. We can't pluck them out, but there's some people who hear the word and it means nothing to them. They don't understand it. There's some people who hear the word, trouble comes and it drives them away. There are people who hear the word and then the world pulls on them and they're gone but there's some people who hear the word and that thing gets down in their spirit and yes they go through the trials and yes the enemy comes and yes there's a looming of the world but they'd rather serve God than the world they'd rather love God than to love the things of the world they would rather love God and live for God than to die and go to a devil's hell this is what Jesus is explaining not everybody who hears the word will understand it, get rooted, and be able to deal with the problems that come along with following Jesus. Let me finish. One out of the four people you can count on to go all the way. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. One, two, th one out of four. This is where Paul's mentoring comes in handy. And I'm going to try to wrap it up right here. I don't think many people know that the book of Philippians that talks about I can do all things through Christ that strengthens me and to be out from the body, be present with the Lord and forgetting those things that are behind and all. Those verses that we love to quote, that in this same book, he addresses disputes and disunity that can occur among the brethren and make things hard on the pastor. In Philippians 2, Paul gives us some strong doctrinal, practical, and instructional exhortation on how to keep things together in the church. Things that members of our churches can do to make their pastors proud. Things that you can do to make your pastor happy. Don't you want to make your pastor happy? Don't you want to be the kind of person that when somebody comes to me, and says, one of your members told me that they go to your church. And I can go, ah, yes, awesome sister, Woo! awesome brother. Oh, you want me to go, were they visiting your church? <laughs> Philippians 2.1. Is there any encouragement for belonging to Christ, any comfort from his love, any fellowship together in the spirit? Are your hearts tender and compassionate? Then make me truly happy by agreeing wholeheartedly with each other, by loving one another and working together with one mind and purpose. Don't be selfish. Don't try to impress others. Be humble. 
thinking of others as better than yourself. Don't look out only for your own interests, but take on interest, take an interest in others too. If this mic wasn't so expensive, that's a mic drop. Every true child of God should have shouted on that. This is what the apostle is saying that we need to be doing, how we need to be living to have the peace, to make our leaders happy, to make our leaders proud of us. So when Paul said in Philippians 2.11, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, so many people take that independently and think that you can just do your own thing your way. No, he's talking about displaying the humility that Jesus displayed to work out the practical implementation of your salvation in your relationships with each other. You can't say you love God who you've never seen and not love your neighbor, your brother or sister who you see every day. It's a family. It's a unit. Come on, y'all. You can stay awake just a little bit longer. Listen to Paul's heart. Here's what he's saying. Listen to what, we, what would make him happy, he says, that would make him proud of his spiritual children. Verse 14. Do everything without complaining and arguing so that no one can criticize you. Live clean, innocent lives as children of God, shining like bright lights in a world full of crooked and perverse people. Hold firmly to the word of life. Then on the day of Christ's return, I will be proud that I did not run in vain and that my work was not useless. God has dealt with me to make this point clear. He has dealt with me for some reason recently. I just run into so many people in stores, restaurants, around town, other places. I just looked at somebody, if I ever said that place, you know I've talked about you. That have run up to me and called me their pastor that I don't recognize. They'll say, you baptized me. You helped me and my family one time, put us in a hotel, took us care of it, and we joined your church. One thing wrong with that statement, it ain't my church. Nobody joins my church. I don't have a church. Jesus said, upon this rock, I'll build my church and the gates of hell cannot be. I'm the pastor of that local congregation. I may be the earthly founding pastor, but it ain't mine. Then they'll say, well, we joined you on Seaboard Avenue. I'm using their vernacular. Um, I've been a member since Lane Avenue. It's okay. I used to worship with y'all at the multiplex. Woo, upstairs there in the Friday night live. Woo, we used to be pumping up up in that standing room only. We thought the floor was going to cave in. We were rocking them. Down. And I'm listening. I'm listening. Mm. Then I say, well, what's your name? <laughs> and where are you now? What are you doing with yourself? I haven't seen you in a long time. I think I remember, you know, we change over the years. I got you now. Who's your family? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then I start probing, prodding, prodding, prodding till I, till I make a connection. And notice me. I'm not saddened that they're gone, they're there for reason or season or tree. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not happy about it. They went out from among us to prove that they were never really of us and, and sometimes uh, the, the worries problems uh, the not understanding the word and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word and they become unfruitful 
They stopped serving. They stopped singing. They become unfruitful. They were in there. The, see, that, that third group of people are really spooky because they were ushering when you came. Now you don't see them no more. They were singing. They were even preaching. But they got caught up. They got in an entanglement. And now they're like, keep your, my name, my wife's name. I, But then they'll say stuff to me like, well, I go to such a so, I'm done y'all, stay with me. I go to such a so church now. And then offer explanations why. And some are legit, some are not. Some say, well, you know, I moved across town during COVID and then I started, you know, staying close that I didn't want to get out. Legit. My car, I don't have no transportation. <clears throat> Not legit, we have vans. My husband don't like you. <laughs> lady, lady, lady told me, said, well, I'll be honest with you, my husband just can't stand you. I said, well, have I met him? No, he ain't never been to the church. I said, well, why he hate me? She says, all I do is talk about what you said. All I do is telling me going to hell. I just repeat you. I'm just preaching the sermon. I have him on at the house. He can't stand you. Why? Because of conviction. Because, he, you know, I ain't, I ain't with him. I ain't running with him like that. That's, that's legit. Oh, you don't like me? Oh. Uh, the church done got too big. I don't, you know, I, I, you know too big. Uh, I like this. This was the best one I think I've ever heard. Um, when I came, uh, the other man was preaching. I thought he was the pastor. <laughs> the other shot. <laughs> or I, I just had a problem with somebody that go to your church. And since COVID, I just never came back. I get a lot of that. And then they'll say, but I'm coming back though. I'm, I'm coming back. Bye bye pastor. <laughs> One more time. I'm gonna prove it to you. Obey your spiritual leaders and do what they say. Their work is to watch over your souls and they are accountable to God. Give them reason to do this with joy and not with sorrow. That would certainly not be for your benefit. Pastors are called to guard the souls of the people that they lead. In that day when Jesus says, enter in, thou good and faithful servant. I told you this in the past. I just believe that I'm after giving account to God for everybody that's ever come through these doors that have ever engaged that ever became a part of this ministry and it just sh I shudder when I think he may ask me where is so and so how did you handle so and so was it your fault or was it their will what did you say what did you do how did you handle my sheep? If anybody leaves the church and stops following a particular leader and don't tell that leader and the members where they're going or what they're doing, I don't think it's out of sorts. The guy in Africa said, I hunt them down and bring them back. He said, I sick members on them. I said, go find them because I just need to know from them how they're doing where they are so that in that day if God asks me I'll be able to say to God they went there or they went there or they went there and I, I went after them I cared for them now those who were never of us that's in the spirit realm those who got caught up who weren't saved that's in the spirit realm but those who loved God but were taken captive it's our responsibility to be able to discern whether they were really one of us 
And when they get caught up into something, it's our responsibility to go and get them, at least to find them and have a face-to-face -face with them. We have to learn to do things right. I had one of our suite members during COVID that went to a church that was near the house because they didn't want to travel across town, and they stayed there. And I talked to the pastor, and I talked to them, and we all met, and we had a great time. And I passed the baton, and I said, you got a good one. You got a good one. She did it right. Right? She did it right. We have to follow right. We also have to leave right. And if we have to leave, leave, you should let your pastors know where you're going. And let them know every now and then how you're doing. But they got to give an account to God. One of the craziest thing in the world that I've ever seen is somebody who's been a part of a ministry for 20 years, 15 years, 10 years. And then they're right here in town with you, but they're somewhere else. You're having celebrations and you're doing stuff. And they don't even stop by and say, happy anniversary. Hey, I'm one of y'all. We're one. It's only one body. We're, we're, let's, let's be that one body. Let's just continue to love each other. What, 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 what happened? I'm, I'm preaching. Here's what John says, Second John. I can't tell you how happy I am to learn that many members of your congregation are diligent in living out the truth exactly as commanded by the Father. But permit me a reminder, friends, that this is not a new commandment, but simply a repetition of our original and basic charter that we love each other. Love means following his commandments and his unifying commandment is that you conduct your lives in love. This is the first thing you heard and nothing has changed. My grandson put him up on the screen. Stephen Vaughn McLaughlin Jr. made me proud. When he survived the pre premature birth and came into the world three months early, I watched him grow and develop into quite the personality. He has a great little personality. He gets along with everybody. He's respectful, mannerable, and my grandson loves the Lord. But I ask him first, not about his toys or this and that. When I pick him up from school, he gets in the car, I say, you love Jesus. And I don't want him just to say yes because I'm the pastor and granddaddy and that's what he's supposed to do. But do you know why you love Jesus? Do you know who Jesus is to me? He's my everything, Steve. He's my everything, son. Everything I have. He wants me to buy a cyber truck. He, he wants me to buy a Lamborghini SUV. He, he loves cars. And he said, Papa, buy a Lambo. Lambo. Get a Lambo SUV. Get, get a cyber. You got to get a cyber truck, too. Get the cyber truck. And I, I said, son, the Lord has not told me. <laughs> they sent me the video. I couldn't be here at the spelling bee, but I got the video of him standing up here spelling his word. He just came right out, talked right into the mic. And I literally, I'm just a wuss, Lord. I'm just honored with you. I just, I just tore up. I would just sit at home. Like <laughs> I kept playing. It wasn't but 10 seconds. And I just kept playing it again and again and again and again. And again. And again. He made me proud. Make me proud. Be a whole Christian. Be a, be a whole Christian. Love each other. Fellowship together. Support one another. Forgive one another. Even as God for Christ's sake has forgiven. Some of you owe me some love. I've shown you a whole lot of love. And when you give love, you, whatever you sow, you're supposed to reap. Some of you need to examine yourself and see that you come for the right reason. I got people out there, they're online and stuff, got their own little ministries and do stuff now, but they encumbered me. They spent time with me. 
They sucked my ideas and took my money. I've housed people and cared for people and loved on people, expecting them to grow and to mature and to become everything that God wants them to be and like your own child that stays juvenile. They make me sad. I know I've done my part. I shouldn't worry about the results. Leave it up to God. But I'm confused about how am I going to have to answer to God for the people that come into my life. I got, I got to answer to God. I got, I got to answer to God. Why I preach like I preach? I could have just shouted today and had a wonderful time. But I'm like, Lord, I got to answer to you for these people. And I don't want to miss it. I, I don't. If I have a microphone and I got somebody in front of me, I have to present the gospel of Jesus Christ to them and let them know that God so loved the world that he gave Gave his only begotten son so that whoso believeth on him should not perish but have everlasting life. God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world but that the world through him might be saved. I had to get my testimony to a doctor the other day and I said I smoked a lot of weed. I started in the cocaine. I drank a lot of liquor and I was so then he said to me <laughs> you know it's like so how do you feel now? I was like, Doc, that was 40 years ago. <laughs> How many of y'all have a testimony of 30 years ago, 20 years ago, 10 years ago, last week? How many of y'all have a testimony? <laughs> and regardless of what you go through, you keep pressing. You keep working. You keep serving. You keep believing. You hold on to the faith. You bring forth fruit 30, 60, 100 fold. Don't let the cares of this world suck you dry. Come on, don't let the problems dry you up. Come on, don't let the enemy come in and steal this word unless you believe it, understand it, and really be saved. Don't die and go to hell. Make sure that Jesus is Lord of your life. You want to make me proud? Come on, somebody needs to celebrate right now that you know of a certainty that you're going to heaven. Make me feel like my having labored in vain. Make me feel like the preaching is not in vain. The teaching is not in vain. I don't care if you try to fool me. Everybody standing. Everybody don't leave. If you can stay, now you can leave all you want to. I'm just saying, if you can stay. All this celebration this month and everything, I told you I feel so appreciated. But if you really want to make me proud, love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. make me proud want to make Paul said make me happy repent and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved some of you have parents that want to be proud of you and don't think that if you gave your heart to Jesus today that it wouldn't make them proud of you my grandson is going to a spelling bee and I'm proud of it. You could be going to heaven and we all could be proud of you. All it takes is you to put your faith in Jesus. To hear a simple message like this from a simple preacher like me can change your life, your trajectory and we can become your spiritual family and I can then be your spiritual father. So are you in here? If you want to know Jesus, you want to make your family proud, you want to make me proud, how about making God proud? You can make God proud. Why don't you come on and give your heart to him? Come on, young man, young lady, no matter where you are, come on, give your heart to Jesus. Come on, give your heart to Jesus. Come on, we're going to clap you. We're going to celebrate in advance. Angels were rejoicing. Come on, give your heart to the Lord. That's it, man. Come on, there's more. There's more of you. Come on, there's got to be somebody else. But the heavens rejoice over one sinner that repents rather than the 99 that need none. Come on, hallelujah. Yeah, come on, I know somebody else is in here. Come on. 
Come on, give your heart to the Lord. Come on, repent. You heard the song. You heard the message. Come on, let's give this thing up. That's it, girl. Give it up. Come on, y'all need to be selling the angels are rejoicing. Come on. At this moment, everybody who is saved should be rejoicing. Not just leaving to get out early in the parking lot. Come on, not just for kickoff. Good job, little man. Good job, girl. Come on, y'all. Jesus is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Come on. 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 Come on closer. Y'all scared. Come on. Hallelujah. <laughs> Let him stand right there. Uh, you know, there's some people like, look at you, girl. Look at you. When y'all sitting together, you know him? Who is that? That that your boyfriend? Is it really? Slide over there with him. Slide over there. You got both of y'all. Both of y'all. Yeah, she said, we're going to even dress it like today. We're going to judge today. I was preaching. And this is so funny. He knew I was saying to him. And she told him several times. She said, shut up. <laughs> she kept, shut up. He's preaching. I'm trying to hear this. Shut up. He was like, I get him. I get him. I lose him. I get him. I lose him. I get him. I forget him. Yeah, I was losing him. Wasn't it? You were like, it's getting late here, baby. Let's get on up out here. This man up there gonna be up there all day long. He was just like, oh my God, what to go? Whoa, whoa, whoa. And now he running down here smiling, grin on your face, man. I appreciate you, buddy. I appreciate you. I appreciate you. you. Made me proud today, man. How old are you? 35. How old are you, baby? Okay, I want to tell you age. I ain't tell everybody. I'm gonna tell I did not tell them that you told me you were 29. Today is the day and the best day and the, and the first day of the rest of your life. Somebody's going to be so proud of you. Somebody you're going to call and say, Mama, Auntie, Grandma, today I gave my life to the Lord. You've been praying for me. How many of y'all know people have been praying for you? Anybody been praying for you? Anybody? Anybody praying for you? You got anybody? She been, you've been praying for her. Look at her. Now come up there and give her a big hug. Then Give her a big hug. We're praying for you all. Oh. Watch this. Are you proud of her? She's proud of you. And that's how I feel every time people give their hearts to the Lord, for real. That's how I feel every time I see somebody that made a commitment to God, then make a commitment to the body and start growing. This ain't the end of it, this is just the beginning. A lot of times we lose people, we just say, okay, I got, we got some type of fire insurance. Some people join the church so they can have a place to have a funeral. You know, that ain't what this is about. This is a place for you to come and live, not die, to live. And I want y'all to know, this has made my day. I want y'all to know, you've made my day. How old are you, man? 34, young man. You know this, brother? That's your oldest son? Somebody been praying for you, boy. Your daddy a praying man. Somebody been praying for you, boy. Good God, has he made you proud today? Has it made you proud? You done made your papa proud, boy. You done made your daddy proud. Good God Almighty. Boy, I'm happy for you, boy. You know I love you. I'm happy for you. That's what I'm talking about. See that little kid right there? That's my grandson. His daddy is my only son. And I'm proud of both of them. I'm proud of both of them. Not even because of a spelling bee or because of the natural birth, but, but both of them have loved the Lord and give their heart to the Lord and that would make a difference. You coming, big dog? Don't give me some doubt, man. Bless you, bro. Come on, y'all. Put your hands together for this, brother Jessica. Father God, we thank you right now for this opportunity to extend this invitation to come to know you. The people on this altar, God, that's going to make many people proud today. But Father, I'm praying that the adversary does not come and steal this word because they don't understand it. 
I pray that as you use these counselors today that they'll make salvation plain. I pray God that they'll leave here today with an understanding of what they just did. And then Father, I'm praying that nothing, no trial, no test that's gonna come because they follow you will pull them back into the world. I pray God that no desire, no riches, no nothing, no cares of this world, no form of lifestyle will pull them away from you. I'm Father and God, I pray that the soil that this seed landed in today is good soil. And I'm praying, God, that their hearts will never change concerning you. In Jesus' name, amen. Put your hands together. Take them with you. Come on, take them with you, baby. Come on, dear. Follow this guy right here. You'll be right back. You're going to come right back. But just take them. Make it quick, too, D. Thank you, guys. I love you, girl. Love you. Thank you. Be seated if you can. People are flooding out. Let me just say to you, can anybody feel me today and just feel my heart today? I just, I just, I know a lot of people are leaving, but I just want you to make, make me proud. May be able to say when I hear your name or somebody describe you to me, I'll be able to say, oh yeah, that's my girl, that's my boy, that's my son, that's my daughter, that's a good member, that's good people. They got gifts, they sold, they blessed, they worked, they served. That's why we're proud. They won the spelling bee. Amen. Fourth place, third place, second place, fourth place. You made it. You placed. As long as you play, as long as you get that crown. Because in that day, there's a crown of righteousness laid up for us. There's a soul winner's crown that's laid up for us. So stop being all over the place. Find a pastor to follow. Find a place where you can get connected. But it ain't about you and your individuality. It's not what you want, it's what you need. And God has a way of meeting your need. Hey there, this is Tiffany, and we are celebrating with you if you've answered the call of God on your life and have accepted his son Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Listen, you are not alone in this new journey. We here at the Potter's House are here to help guide you on your new walk with Christ. If that is you, give us a call or a text at 1-800-TPH-4JAX. That's 1-800-874-4529. And let us know that you've accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. We would be more than happy to walk you through your next steps in Christ. You can also put in the chat, I accepted Jesus, and we'll reach out to you for your next step. Now, if you're interested in becoming a member, we welcome you to the Potter's House, and you can do it right here online. If you're viewing us from your computer, visit tphim.org and in the top right hand corner, click the link, become a member and fill out the short form. If viewing us on a mobile device, go to tphim.org and in the top right hand corner, select the menu bar and then select become a member and follow the prompts and someone from our discipleship team will reach out to you. We thank you for joining us from wherever you may be viewing. And make sure you like and subscribe to our YouTube channel at TPHJax so that you can receive alerts of when we're on the air.